From Buffalo, Toronto Public Media and WBFO, this is What's Next Producers Picks, highlights of conversations heard on previous episodes. On today's show... We just installed literally about a week ago a vending machine for Narcan and fentanyl test strips that can be accessed 24-7. Lori Matson and Jessica Shawnee from Evergreen Health System. And we close with... I fight every day, so I feel like a warrior. I feel like I'm, I'm fighting, you know, to live every day. So that's, that's pretty much what warriors do, right? Author and sickle cell disease activist Juanita McLean and director of the Sickle Cell Hemoglobinopathy Center of Western New York, Dr. Stephen Ambrusco. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. First, we revisit Jay Moran's conversation with Lori Matson and Jessica Shawnee for Evergreen Health System. The three discussed the opening of the new Evergreen facility in Jamestown and the future of healthcare in the Southern Tier. All right. Well, let's just start with you, you, Jessica, since you were the one that had to get involved and make this whole project a reality. Where did it start for Evergreen in, in terms of acquiring this facility and then making it what it is today? We knew we wanted to expand on our services in Jamestown. We leased a building that housed our care coordination team and at the time our specialty care team. The building became up for sale, so we purchased it in 2020 and then began the phases of how could we make this a one-stop shop to represent what we do in Buffalo at our 206 South Elmwood location. Does it really mirror the, the location here in Buffalo? Not fully. We hopefully will get there. It it's very similar to what we do at 206, though. And, and let's um, uh, let Lori maybe then outline that. What are the, the services that are available? Sure. And I know um, there are a lot. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is a lot, and I definitely keep a list with me. Yep. In our medical office, we are now doing primary care, so... It, it just general practice is okay. fine. And then we started with specialty care. Once upon a time, we were AIDS community services. So we started with care for the HIV population. We have expanded those, our services in the medical to hepatitis C specialty. We actually do a little bit of gynecology. And our biggest change and biggest addition that we've had in the recent year or two is the addition of transgender care. So that's all in the medical. Aside from that, we also have our syringe exchange program. We have three people working that. The syringe exchange program offers much more than just syringe exchange. We have behavioral health coming down. We are doing medicated assisted treatment now. Uh, we do Narcan training. We installed a vending machine for Narcan and fentanyl test strips that can be accessed 24 hours at the, a day. At the facility? Huh? Uh, at the facility. It's outside of the facility, so right. people can access it 24-7. Our biggest program that we have in the building is our care coordination program, which has been around since 1991. It's definitely had some changes over the years. When we first started doing care coordination, it was absolutely geared towards people who were living with HIV. Back in 2013, we began doing care coordination under the New York State Health Homes Program, which was a change up from the program that we were under previously. So we currently have 20 care coordinators working out of the building and 20. 20. And those 20 care coordinators service people in their homes or at their providers across Chautauqua County, Cattaraugus County, and Allegheny County. And just to step back a little bit, and I'll let either uh, Lori or Jessica take this. So Evergreen services are available to whom? Who can access Evergreen? It depends on which program you're looking to okay. access, um, but it's really open to everyone. Like I said, we're really excited that we have our primary care, so literally anybody can come in for that. Our care coordination program is funded through Medicaid, so anybody who is receiving Medicaid services can potentially do our services. Care coordination is for people with chronic conditions, so it could be HIV. Like I said, that's where our heart and history is, but then we also service people with serious mental illness and people who have other chronic conditions. We're, we, we're serving a lot of people with diabetes, and that's like the biggest kind of chronic condition we see, and then substance use as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm most certainly, as you're listing those, I'm, I'm going to ask you quite a few questions yep. about uh, how often those services are, are utilized in the Jamestown and Southern Tier area. But it, well, let's just switch back, though, to Jessica here. So you just heard the list of things that are available there. You had to 
put together a, a structure that was renovated and available to access yes, uh, we had for all to of these. Design a space that kind of fit everyone's needs. One of the huge things that was a driving factor in renovating the building was making sure that the building was accessible. Was it beforehand? No, not mm. at all. So Even the, though at one time it was a doctor's office. Correct. Okay. The only means of access was from the exterior of the building. It's kind of an oddly shaped building where it's kind of four levels stacked on top of each other, but horizontally. There was no elevator inside of the building. So if you wanted to access the fourth level, you kind of had to take this interior chair. Sure. It looked like it was from like the 1950s. Wow. And then the other spaces, you would have to go to that level and enter from there. So with us wanting to have a one-stop shop kind of for everything, our patients would have had to have left the building, go to another area within the parking lot to enter that space. So it was very important to us to make the interior accessible. So with the help of the city of Jamestown, we installed ALULA, which is an acronym for a limited use, limited access elevator. Okay. Um, maybe expand on that just a little bit if you, as best you can. You seem to have a great control of these construction related <laughs> terms. Um, simply put, it's an elevator that moves very, very slowly okay. because it does not have an elevator pit on the bottom or a roof access point. So it's required to kind of go really slow. But it it allows our patients and our staff who may have mobility concerns to be able to access those levels without the inconvenience of going outside or up the stairs. What about aesthetics? Is that important in, in this type of thing? Obviously, you, you need the services, but was that a consideration we as well? We a, did a huge facelift on the interior as well as the exterior of the building. All of the finishes throughout the building were redone. It was old wood paneling. We updated it all to drywall, new tile flooring. Our marketing team did a great job of the putting our in-game paint stuff on side. We redid the roof. Anything that we could do in the building, a lot of the things that were out to date was a lot of the larger expenses were towards like mechanical fixtures. So plumbing needed to be completely mm. redone. Electric needed to be redone. The roof, the windows, the, um, parking, lot. the parking lot needed to comple completely regraded to make it ADA accessible. Um, the slopes before- It had to be completely regraded. Yes. The whole front of the building, we dug up about 18 feet down, built a 12 foot retaining wall and regraded it. So the front of the parking lot was flat and then did some minor regrading around the rest of the building. Wow. Evergreen must have really thought that this was an important Accessibility project. Accessibility is huge yes. for us. Yeah. yeah Accessibility that's... and the commitment to the community. We've always been committed to the community, but I think this is just such a, a great way to show that commitment that we've renovated this building. We've made it absolutely beautiful and accessible to all. Let's talk a little bit in general. Just to, though we're all from Western New York, Jamestown in, in some ways, if you're from Buffalo, Maybe uh, it's not really a place that you've spent a lot of time, although some people end up buying cabins down there when they get there a lot. They, they find out how beautiful it is. But what about the need in Jamestown? I've been there, and I, I always can kind of compare Jamestown to Olean, mm -hmm. uh, Dunkirk, Batavia, these small cities that had their architecture and infrastructure reflect a time that is long past and that prosperity that was there. And Jamestown most certainly reflects that with a lot of the residential and commercial architecture that's long gone. So what, I guess for those who don't know about Jamestown, talk about Jamestown. Ooh, okay. I'm not sure what avenue to go down Well, first. I mean, just in terms of the people who live there, you know, what we see in terms of both, you know, age demographics mm -hmm. and maybe even in terms of uh, poverty levels and things along those lines as well. Poverty level is pretty high. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me to quote no. stats. Right. Jamestown, I think, is, in my opinion, it's on the verge of trying to make itself something different. I'm sure you are familiar with the National Comedy Center that has brought a lot of attention to Jamestown, um, and it's been lovely. But we also have a large drug user population, which... It's been interesting because it's different than what we see in Buffalo. Um, I think from what I've been told, drug of choice in Buffalo is a lot of the, the opioids, mm -hmm. and we are dealing with that epidemic. We are dealing with that in Jamestown, but the drug of choice tends to be more methamphetamine. We don't know why, but that is definitely what we're seeing. So that's a huge population, and we are certainly experiencing the same level of overdose that we're seeing across the country. So... The other thing that kind of plays into that is, again, we're coming from a place of dealing with 
the HIV AIDS epidemic. And what we are seeing with the opioid epidemic mirrors what we saw in the 80s and the 90s a lot in that you have young, vibrant people who were seen lose their lives. And the stigmas are so similar to the stigmas that we saw back in the 90s when we were dealing with the AIDS crisis. So it it just kind of felt like it was something we needed to take on. We had experience with dealing with that type of epidemic. I I, I appreciate the perspective, and and maybe it's a little harder for you because I know we've talked before we went on the air that though you've spent time elsewhere uh, in your career, you know, the Jamestown, Lakewood area, that's your, your home base. But I guess for our listeners, what types of these problems are unique to Jamestown? And also we'll get into this as well. You're also helping to serve Cattaraugus County, mm-hmm. helping to serve Allegheny County. Mm-hmm. If you spend any time down in those areas, for the most part, very rural areas with the centers being Olean and, and Jamestown Correct. and uh, Dunkirk. So to that, you know, I, there might be an impression that well, Jamestown's just this idyllic small town. It's it's yeah. it's the Southern Tears version of Mayberry. But and there is a lot of that in sure, Jamestown. I right. will definitely say that. Right. Um, but there are real problems and real issues. Absolutely, like there are anywhere. Our clientele has an extreme lack of transportation services. That has forever been difficult where up here in evergreen they have the ability to do bus passes and tokens and uber and taxis and we really don't have that in the southern tier in any of the counties we have very limited medicaid transportation that can be utilized but you have to have medicaid and you have to be going to a medical appointment and just the lack of services that are available for like specialty care. If you live in Jamestown or Olean or in the country in Cattaraugus, if you need to see a neurologist, you're going to be driving to Buffalo or you're going to be driving to Erie. We service Allegheny County. We have a lot of people who go to Rochester for some of those bigger specialty services. But those are all barriers. Just as an example, when our syringe exchange program first opened in Jamestown, it was not in the Prather building. It was with the Mental Health Association in Jamestown. They rented a space for us to do that. That space was one-eighth of a mile from the Prather building where our medical services were. Now, at the syringe exchange, they do rapid HIV testing and rapid hepatitis C testing. So if they were to get a positive It sounds easy enough to say, well, hey, you can go over to our medical office and get you signed up for care. Even though it was one eighth of a mile, people rarely made it. Now that all of these services are in the same building, should they get a positive, they can say, hey, let me walk you downstairs and introduce you to our medical staff. And that easy, we're getting them set up for treatment. So just by making this facility accessible, it's increased the people you've been able to, to help. Correct. Wow. Uh, we talked about aesthetics and also about making sure things are actually accessible for uh, you know ADA at the same time. What about just the idea of having a, a facility that is welcoming to people who, and I, I know this is, maybe we can get into this as well, Lori, in a little bit, but that idea that you know, there are people who have to make that jump in their lives to get some of these services that Lori's just talked about. How important is that? Was that in your thinking when you were putting this all together? It's always important to us. We always want the first look to be welcoming. So we worked with SWBR, who was the architect on the project, and is very familiar with Evergreen's kind of aesthetic and the way we like things to be. So from the moment you pull in the parking lot, we want it to be welcoming. We want you to see it and say like, oh, I would go there to see my doctor or I would go there for the syringe exchange or care coordination. So that's always huge to us when designing a space is making sure that from the get-go when you see the building, it looks welcoming and it's inviting. And it also provides a level of privacy to our patients. Not everyone wants everyone to know who they go to for their doctor. So we're always considering all aspects of who we serve when designing a space. And I'm 
curious about, you said there's an evergreen look. I, I'm paraphrasing to a certain extent, but uh, expand on that. What, what goes inside that look? It's really our colors. I feel like yeah. we're very known for the green. Um, <laughs> the colors and our signage as well as marketing has worked very well on our campaign, Unconditional. So a lot of our buildings now, you'll see all of these beautiful decals that they put together that kind of expands on the unconditional aspect of things, which really encompasses a lot of the different looks of the patient demographic that we serve. So now in Jamestown, that building kind of has that on the outside as well as the exterior. And you also, inside your vast title of Associate VP of uh, Facilities and Emergency Management, you know, security has to be a big part of this. You mentioned this before we were on the air. You're not, that's not really your part of this, but you were designing the building or helping to renovate it, making sure how important was security when it came to that? Because again, we're talking about some very sensitive things at a time where, unfortunately, certain facilities are becoming, well, I, I hate to use the word targets, but that's, no, uh, that's not untrue. It's not untrue, unfortunately. Security and safety for the patients and our staff is always top priority for us. So with the Jamestown location, we installed exterior cameras throughout the space, upgraded the lighting on the building so the parking lot wasn't dark at night. We also use access control, which is a fob access within our spaces. So if you're an employee, you kind of badge in, get let in. We do have an on-site security guard there who is phenomenal, Mm -hmm. who does rounds and just kind of checks in on people. He's very well known in the area. Dakota, he's great. So security (laughs) is always very important to us, but we also don't want it to feel when you walk into a space intimidating either. so our security guards and the measures we take for security are always also inviting to. So a delicate balance there. Correct. Yeah, for Definitely. sure. Definitely. And I was going to say, like she was saying, our security guard, Dakota Houston. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dakota. Dakota's pretty popular, apparently. <laughs> um, he just strikes that balance so well. When people come in, I don't think that they immediately are like, oh, security guard. A lot of people come in and they know him by name at this point, and he is friendly with everyone, and he does strike that balance very well. I want to get into some of the services, Lori, that mm-hmm. are offered there. They all really stand out as being tremendously valuable, but transgender care. Sure. This is a relatively new, and we'll just leave it at mm-hmm. that. But talk about who, I don't want to get too specific here, obviously there's privacy issues, but at the same time, you know, who are you seeing who's coming in for transgender care at uh, Evergreen? Well, it's hard to say who. I mean, it's definitely in the transgender population, um, which we are seeing an increase in, not because there is an increase, but there's an increase in people who are more open about being transgender. Just a couple of years ago, our Buffalo location just kind of took note of how many people were coming to our Buffalo location for those services from the Southern Tier, which again, I don't have an exact number for you. But 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 that's worth worth noting for sure. It was a big enough number that our primary care provider, Elizabeth Gatman, went and got all the training she needed to do that. And we brought that service to Jamestown so the people in the Southern Tier don't have to travel to Buffalo anymore. And it's interesting. you, you, You stated it very accurately that, you know, it's not necessarily that there's an increase in of the need, but it's an increase in of the people who are actually coming to access those services. Yep, yep absolutely. How much, I mean, I'll throw this out to both of you, how much then, when, again, when you're putting together a new facility, and this is going to be one of the, the services offered, how does that play into, for lack of a better term, strategy or, or just viewpoint when it comes to you know, how we're going to make this an available situation for uh, people who are seeking transgender care. Uh, anybody want to tackle that one? I mean, you know, how does that play into well, your th- thought process? I was going to say, I, I don't think that it was a targeted population okay. necessarily. But a needed service. But a needed service, absolutely. And like I said, it was more presented to us that this need is here hmm. and we can be here to serve that. I will say, again, going back to our history, we are very familiar with people being afraid of stigma, people being afraid of being judged. A lot of people will not access services because they don't know how they are going to be welcomed, if they're going to be welcomed. So it's always at the forefront of our mind for all populations, if possible, to feel comfortable coming into the space. And 
I think the unconditional campaign, if anybody out there has seen our, our billboards, we tried very hard to make sure that those billboards represented the people who were serving. That's got to be tremendously, I would think, gratifying to, to know that here's a place where, and you, I'll just to kind of paraphrase you, maybe 10 years ago, this person might not have sought no. this care. No. No. And if they were going to, they would definitely have to travel. So. So it's a good addition to the area. You talked about the syringe exchange program. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something we were talking also before we went on the air. There, Some places, syringe exchange is not a welcome part of the community Correct. in some places. Mm -hmm. How is it in Jamestown? Knock on wood, we have not had a lot of backlash. I was saying before the interview that if 10 years ago you had told me there would be a syringe exchange in Jamestown, I would not have believed it. Mm. But again, the need is there. And we actually had the chief of police in Jamestown, whose name is Samuelson. And I don't think he is still there, but he actually approached Evergreen to talk about bringing that service down because our evergreen in buffalo has had this syringe exchange for more years than i can say so it was actually leaders in the community who asked us to bring this service to jamestown and so far it's been great and it's been a few years now yeah and so no issues with the community in that regard mm -mm. but very successful very successful. Definitely had a slow start. A syringe exchange program is different than other services in that it's not something that is advertised a whole lot. It really is more of a word of mouth kind of service. And it's gaining that trust with people who really don't have a lot of trust in a lot of other service areas. So yeah. So okay, very good, very good. Wanted to also talk about care coordination. You were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. let, let me expand on that. What exactly were we talking about with care coordination? In essence, like a, a primary sure. physician or some uh, primary care person <clears throat> would be overseeing somebody's health services. How does that work? Yep, care coordination. I always say it's like the social worky side of healthcare. Our care coordinators are linkage extraordinaires, <laughs> I would say. I've described care coordination previously as we're kind of like the middle spoke of the wheel. Right. And their job is to ensure that people are getting the health care that they need, that they have the insurance to cover the health care that they need, and really just keep people connected. So many of our folks have more than one provider. They're seeing a lot of different providers. Part of our job is to make sure that those providers know what the other providers are doing. So it's really a lot of guiding people through a very complicated healthcare system. Yeah, that is uh, for, for sure, uh, people that have need. Uh, Jessica, uh, just turning to you here uh, for a second, how much was this project, how much did this cost, putting this all together between purchasing the building between and renovating. purchasing the building and renovations, uh, $4.8 million was the, our total cost for it. And that's outside of like furniture and like IT things, so like moving the server over and things like that. That was purchasing the building and renovations. So when the people you work for at Evergreen came to you, they said, this is a priority. Go get it done, no matter what it costs? Oh, uh, no, it's never, it's never a no matter so. what it costs <laughs> conversation. Um, it's always a, how much is this going to cost? And then we kind of take it from there. We did do a lot of value engineering. We also had some great funders that helped the project. Um, Garmin Foundation, the city of Jamestown. Sheldon and Foundation. Sheldon Foundation. Community founder, the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation. And I'm just going to you can double check. We that. had a, a few donors that helped with the project, and then the rest was kind of self-funded. So it was kind of a get it done thing. We wanted to get it done. We knew what we needed to do. And our CEO really wanted to make sure that we were providing a space that was very deserved in Jamestown, not only for our patients, but our staff too. Mm -hmm. Lori could probably attest to this. They were working out of a house that was kind of utilized as an office space, which they were running out of room. Our, um, our care coordination. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we really wanted to make sure that 
they were under the same roof as our other services, as well as a space that was fitting for their needs and their patients' needs. And job well done? Yeah, I job would like to say job <laughs> extremely well done. The, the building is beautiful. And really, the, the teams that worked out there during renovations, because we did not stop services in the building. Everyone worked in there while we were renovating. So they really were great in the process of getting it done and still meeting with patients. So Mm -hmm. Wow. And how long did it take? Oh, nine months roughly from start to finish. Turner Construction was very good at sticking with the deadline. We knew we wanted to have everyone in the building before 2024. And they actually just barely meet the deadline of reopening in December. But the origins of this particular project, though, were actually what, pre-COVID? Is that, do I have to understand that right? Correct. We started the process of looking into what we wanted to do in the building in 2020 when we purchased the building. And then with COVID, we kind of put things on hold for a little while. So you, then you returned to it and here we are yes. today, huh? Mm-hmm. How was the grand opening? Amazing. Yeah. I kind of, I was in a blur. I don't really remember much. There was a lot <laughs> happening that day. Yes. A lot of places you need to be, a lot of people you need to talk to. But it was great. It was a great turnout. I think the staff really mm-hmm. enjoy the building. Um, it was good. Yeah. And just to note, as Jessica said, we were really trying to get everybody in the building and done by the end of 2023. 2023 was Evergreen's 40th birthday. So we really kind of wanted to, you know, add this little hanging to our hat on our 40th anniversary. Well, congratulations on that. Yeah. Let's expand just a little bit, Lori, beyond the facility in the Southern Tier. Mm -hmm. You've got quite a space to cover, uh, lots and lots of rural space. Mm -hmm. Talk about the challenges of doing that. Sure. It's been a long time coming, I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So we do cover all three counties, and we always have for care coordination. And we will continue to do that. When Health Homes first started, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to cover all of it, and we have been able to do that. And again, just for historical purposes, I started at the agency in 1999. When I began, there were five employees in the Jamestown office. We were doing HIV education and care coordination. We now have 45 people who are working in this new building, and that's just how we have grown, and we've grown with these additional programs. Difficulties in the rural areas. Like I said before, transportation is always at the top of the list. Sure, because, I mean, from Jamestown, let's say, to Alfred, which is in Allegheny County, that's got to be two a, hours. a two-hour yep, drive. Almost two hours. Okay. Yeah. And there's a whole other part of Chautauqua County to the west that you yep. also have to serve as yep. well, which is pretty expansive. Yep, to the west and the north. What we have been able to do, and we joke about this all the time, because when COVID happened, The care coordination department really wasn't affected that much because we have always had people who have worked remotely before because of the territory. So we have care coordinators who live in Cattaraugus County. They work out of their homes and visit and go to doctor's appointments and what have you from their homes. Okay. They still come into the office. So I just like to point that out because I think some people are like, well, I don't I don't know if I want somebody to service me who's in Jamestown when I live in Belmont in Allegheny County. Right. When that really isn't the case. We're really all over. Difficulties. Other well, diff- I mean, yeah. as you were talking about how, I mean, transportation obviously is a big part of it. I would, but marketing and making sure that People know that these services are available. Yep. Again, you know, city life, Buffalo, perhaps, you know, there's a word of mouth or whatever the case may be that and there's a little bit more of a critical mass. You know, right. you, you mentioned Belmont. We can keep on mentioning small towns where maybe just a handful of individuals might be in need of these services, but are in need of these services. Exactly. Exactly. So how do you get the word out? Through the New York State Health Home Program, it's been kind of nice because there is a a network. So again, I will speak for care coordination in that most of the people who come to us, they are either coming because of word of mouth or they're being referred to us from hospitals and doctor's offices. Some of the managed care organizations we work with will also encourage people to have our services. Care coordination is completely voluntary, so it's totally up to the person whether or not it's something they want to participate in. 
We also, just for the sake of saying it, once a month, we take our specialty care for hepatitis C and HIV to Olean Department of Health. That's something that we have done for a long time since we've actually started doing primary and specialty care. So we do try to take our services to folks as much as we possibly can. But we're talking about hundreds of square miles exactly. uh, in those three counties, for mm-hmm. sure. I'm curious about the Olean service, well attended by people looking for services? I would say yes. A lot of folks who have been with us for a long time, actually. Really? So, mm-hmm. I see a little gleam in your eyes you say that. It, it's just, I have a long history with Evergreen and a long history when we were AIDS Community Services. And like I said before, that's where my heart lies. And a lot of people who I was a care coordinator for 20 years ago who are still with us today for their primary care and their HIV care. So success stories. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, We were just talking, not to, I don't think I'm going to do any health information, but some of our population is getting quite elderly. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the fact that those folks have been living with HIV since before we even had medication for it, and there's healthier than I am, let's just say that, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Right, right. But the point is, if these services weren't available in that area, the success might not be there. I would have to agree with that, yeah. Yeah. I want to switch just a little bit here, Jessica, because I know Evergreen's always looking to expand, grow. Obviously, the Jamestown commitment speaks for itself. What else should we be looking for, I guess, or could we might expect to hear from Evergreen as we move forward? What could you share? Ooh, how can I answer that? I know, Um, I know. We are looking to expand in the Bailey-Kensington area. Um, We're still in the very early stages of that development. Um, We've been working very closely with the community and some of the community leaders in that area to really gauge what services they would like to see within that area. So still more to come. Sure. And it's still very early in the process of all of that. Right. So you probably not, you don't have a lot in terms of what you've been able to get from the, the community so far. We just had our third community meeting. But at the same time, so you're going to be involved in the process, though. You're going to be getting this input. I mean, how, how do you go about doing that now? Because, again, you just got done with Jamestown. You saw what was needed there. And Made that a success, your thought process or how this process might move forward? We work very closely with a few consultants in the area. Art Hall is one of them from Hallmark. And then really Justin Azzarella, who is our chief strategy officer, is really the one that's kind of gearing a lot of this project so far. I really get involved once the architect gets involved. So right now I kind of take the back seat and just listen. And then once the architect really starts getting involved is kind of when I step in. Are you likely to purchase... uh older facilities, uh, older structures and utilize them, build new? Am I allowed to say, God, I hope not? (laughs) Um, (laughs) A lot of our buildings are old. So as the person that kind of manages them, they need a lot of upkeep. So I really hope that for a while, as we really focus on the Kaz Ken Bailey project and the Southern Tier, that we kind of settle in right there until those two projects are complete. Okay, very good, very good. Lori, what about Jamestown? You were, you were kind of getting into it a little bit before. You're saying it's a place that's showing some hope. I would have to think that this, the Evergreen Health Facility, is a sign of hope and for things to come in Jamestown. Oh, I really hope so. Yeah? I, I really hope so. I, I can say, again, even when we were AIDS Community Services or when we were Evergreen, there's still times when people will say, oh, I haven't heard of Evergreen. Sure. You know, tell me about that. And it's like, you've been here for 20-some <laughs> years. So it's nice to kind of have that... I don't want to use the word aesthetic, but to to have this building to say we're here, which again is very interesting because the first two places where we had an office in Jamestown, we didn't even have signage back then because we didn't necessarily want people to know that this is where AIDS Community Service is in. So to jump into the future and now have this beautiful building that says Evergreen Health and in it, it, having it be so welcoming, it, it just does feel like it's it's really cemented our place in Jamestown. And it's really quite a perspective that it shows that there was a time where you almost didn't want people to know what you were doing. Yep. 
and now we want everybody to know what we're doing right and that and that, and similarly though that also shows that you, you have become a, a key part of the community yeah i hope so that was Lori Matson and Jessica Shawnee from Evergreen Health System. And we close today's show with my conversation with Monita McLean and Dr. Stephen Ambrusco. We discuss promising breakthroughs in treating sickle cell disease and what roadblocks remain. Dr. Ambrusco, tell us about sickle cell disease. A lot of people probably have heard of the disease, but don't really understand what it is and its traits. Sure, I'd be glad to. It is a blood disorder and it is an inherited blood disorder. So it's genetic. So you are born with it, you have it. It's not something that you can catch later in life. It's not something that is contagious by any means. You're born with it. And it is a blood disorder affecting the protein inside our red blood cells called hemoglobin. And unfortunately, it makes those red blood cells change shape, break apart too fast, and clump up in our blood vessels. And because blood goes everywhere, that affects every organ system in the body. And the most classic things that come to mind when you think about sickle cell disease is these incredible episodes of pain because you're getting blockage of blood flow to areas of your body. And because of the early effects in the body, especially on the spleen, patients are at incredibly high risk of life-threatening blood infections. And this disease, at least in the United States, is more commonly found in, in African Americans? Yes. Why is that? So to go into the science of it a little yes. bit, there is malaria is a horrible disease that affects so many areas of the world. And people who carry the trait for sickle cell disease, not the disease itself, but the trait, have a survival benefit. Meaning if you have two people who both get malaria and one is unaffected and one has sickle cell trait, the person with sickle cell trait is more likely to survive. And over centuries and, and millennia, those people would then survive more and then, of course, have children, and then that's where you get the disease. So areas of the world that have malaria is where you tend to see sickle cell disease, most predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa. So majority of people in the world and in the United States with sickle cell disease are in the black community. However, the third most common country is actually India where you see sickle cell disease. But you can see it in South Asia, the Middle East, Southern Mediterranean, but mostly in people of African descent. And, and how long have you been working on this? I, so I started working specifically in sickle cell disease during my fellowship training in pediatric hematology oncology and really fell in love with that end of the pediatric hematology care really finding a, a, a bond with a lot of our patients with sickle cell disease and just the being able to know that I can maybe help their lives in some way, shape, or form because they struggle so much on so many different levels. It might be one disease, but there's such a huge spectrum of how much this disease can affect people. What improvements have you seen over the course of your work? So when I first started out, there was really only one FDA approved medication for sickle cell disease. And that's the way it was for a couple decades. But even with that one drug, which initially was used a bit more limited, we now use it in so many patients called a medicine called hydroxyurea. So just that one medication alone, expanding its use, starting it in babies as young as six months old has been life-changing for those with sickle cell disease. It, it's a medicine to help the disease be better but it's not a cure. Mm -hmm. Now we at least have four FDA approved medications in the United States to treat sickle cell disease and to make the disease better, but none of them are obviously a cure. Where do you find that challenges still exist? So that is where the, the cure question comes into play. Even though those medications were not a cure, bone marrow transplant has been around for quite some time, actually, for sickle cell disease, but with potentially high toxicities depending upon the patient. And also the biggest issue with that is finding a donor to be able to have somebody be cured of their sickle cell disease, but having to find a donor in order to do so. But obviously that brings us to this day and age where we've finally have the holy grail in sight with gene therapy for sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get back to that in a little bit. Juanita, I want to bring you in. You've got a very interesting story, a very great story. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? 
Sure. My name is Juanita McLean. I'm sorry, I'm so used to introducing my name. <laughs> and um, I have been living with sickle cell my entire life, of course. I was diagnosed with sickle cell SS as early as six months old. I've um, been living with complications since that time. I know my mother said my earliest crisis was when I was about six months. That's how she found out I had it. And I believe my childhood growing up with sickle cell disease, it was very difficult just dealing with a lot of the complications with different infections and, of course, the pain crisis. The pain crisis are very, very debilitating crises that are unexplainable. We, we always say crisis, sickle cell crisis, but they really have a, a really strong meaning to them because these crises, they impact you like in all areas of your life. Now, is that um, when you talk about a sickle cell crisis, that pain, does it just come out of nowhere? Yes. Out of nowhere, I can be perfectly fine one minute, and then maybe five minutes later, I can be in pain all over my body. And it's just due to that lack of oxygen, lack of blood flow. Oftentimes, our bodies, they begin to sickle, but we don't notice it's happening mm -hmm. until it's too late. So, like, you're already probably in that crisis stage. You know, the pain is already there, and there's nothing you really can do about it besides take your treatments or, you know, ER visits, things like that to help you feel better. But oftentimes you can have crisis that lasts for either one day or you can have crisis that might last for weeks or a month. And that's really remarkable. I mean, I couldn't imagine having to deal with that on a daily basis. How has your management of the sickle cell disease changed since, you know, you were six months old. You're an adult now, obviously. Mm -hmm. How is that? Has it morphed in any way? It actually has a whole lot. I just believe that me suffering so much as a child led to me wanting to be a lot more knowledgeable about sickle cell and just wanting to know how can I do better? How can I not go into so many crises? And I've always loved to write. And writing became my outlet to helping me just get out those feelings that I felt about being in so much pain my entire life. And I just feel like writing helped me cope. And I started to feel better after I started to share with people. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes we find that sickle cell warriors, we don't share our stories. We don't tell people that we have sickle cell. We keep it to ourselves. It's kind of like this secret disease, you know. So once I started to feel more, like just be vulnerable and share my story with other people and let them know like what sickle cell is and how it's impacted me, I feel like it helped me change the mindset that I had about the disease, and with that change of mindset became better health for me. It, it has been over a year since I had a sickle cell crisis, and even before that, I was only in a hospital maybe once or twice a month compared to my younger years or teens and 20s when I was in a hospital maybe like five and six times a year. So what does that mindset look like right now, today? Just really positive and just knowing that I can do anything regardless of this disease. Just staying in that positive mind frame. And I, I believe that leaning on my faith. I mean, I know everybody doesn't believe in God, but I believe in God. And I lean on that faith. And I pray all the time. And I just try to stay positive in everything that I do. Anything that comes in my mouth, I want it to be a positive outcome. So I have to speak that positive life into myself. You mentioned you're a writer. Yes. An author. One of the books you've written is called Stepping Stones. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, Stepping Stones came from every sickle cell warrior goes through losing some type of organ, right? Whether it's our spleen, our gallbladder, some type of organ. When I was 11 years old, I lost my gallbladder due to gallstones. And so Stepping Stones came from me wanting to bring out the awareness of how sickle cell affects the organs. And so I wrote Stepping Stones and the character, she basically goes through a scenario with her support system, which is her mother and her faith. And she tries to manage and cope living with sickle cell while also dealing with this other situation, which was having those gallstones and having to get her gallbladder removed at such a young age. So that's why I wrote Stepping Stones, because I know that so many warriors can relate to that because they probably have gone through the same thing. And, and why do you call yourself a sickle cell warrior? Because I fight every day. I fight every day. So I feel like a warrior. I feel like I'm, I'm fighting 
you know, to live every day. So that's that's pretty much what warriors do, right? They fight to survive. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And you, you mentioned that you find writing therapeutic, you find strength in that. Is there anything else where you find strength? As I know you've got two boys. Actually, uh, three boys. Three boys. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you find strength in them? I, I definitely find strength in my children. They keep me going. When I'm down, when they know I'm like in a sickle cell crisis, they're very helpful. They keep my spirits lifted. They try to be, you know, just as helpful as they can. I just love that. And me just seeing them, seeing me when I'm hurt, like their reaction, things like that, it, it motivates me to want to get up, not live in that pain, not live in that moment, and just like fight through it. And so that I can be the strength for them and myself. The two of you have a pretty darn good relationship. Mm -hmm. How yes. did that start? Well, when I was about 16, 17, we were losing our doctor, Dr. Grossi. And I think Dr. Ambrusco was just coming in. I was a resident. You, then, yeah, so he was a resident. And they introduced me to new doctors that I will be moving on to. So transitioning over from pediatric to adulthood. Dr. Ambrusco was one of those in the meeting. And he works really close with my doctor, Jennifer Abelis. And when I wanted to start like a support group in a nonprofit, I went to Dr. Abelis and, and Dr. Ambrusco and I let them know what I wanted to do and they were very helpful. And like Dr. Ambrusco mentioned before, we had quite a few different people and meetings and things that we went through before to try to get these nonprofits and groups started and things kept falling through, but we kept going, we kept fighting for it. and. Even though I ended up starting it all on my own, but I just feel like Dr. Ambrusco was always my support. And when I needed information or when I need help with a certain situation, that's who I can go to because he's just very supportive to the sickle cell community. So We needed somebody like Juanita in the community. Like she mentioned, there was always some interest in really forming a, a community group, a community-based group for sickle cell disease. But for somebody to really kind of take the reins and just go with it, we needed somebody with Juanita's passion and energy, and, and, and that's what she's done. But as I've reflected on, too, one of the things with a lot of conditions, but I think with sickle cell disease more than any other condition, you need support that's not at the hospital. While obviously on the medical end of thing between you know myself and nurses and nurse practitioners and psychologists and social workers and all that stuff, if I say, hey, let's do something to support our patients, mm -hmm. it's coming from the medical field. It's coming mm -hmm. from the, the healthcare area. Mm -hmm. And that's where sickle cell patients don't wanna be. They don't like going to the hospital, and mm -hmm. who can blame them? They're going to the hospital when it's at their worst. So having that place, that place for support and, and safety and education on the outside of the medical field, as well as getting it from the, the healthcare field, is so crucial in being able to have that. And, and on, with sickle cell disease also, there's a lot of stigma with sickle cell disease. So being able to commiserate with other people who are going through it is so crucial. It's a rare disease, but it's not. It's like you even said at the beginning, most people may have heard that term before, but they don't really know about it. And and even in the community that you see it in, even in the black community, people have heard about it, but they don't always really know about it. Or they might say, oh yeah, I know one person who has it. So if you have sickle cell disease, you're oftentimes feeling alone in it, even within your family too. So being able to talk to not just one person, but several people mm -hmm. who are also going through the same thing you are is so meaningful to know it's not just you and also to take strength in other people and seeing, hey, if that person who has this disease even worse than, than I do can really carry on and fight as a warrior, as, as mm -hmm. Juanita appropriately said, is just so beneficial to our patients who really do need all of that understanding of disease to just go and do what they need to do in life. And I want to talk about sickle cell warriors a little more in just a bit. But Dr. Ambrusco, talk to me about developing relationships with patients on your end. All of my patients are my kids. Um, <laughs> I, I, I may have two kids at home, but I also have about 150 children at the hospital. <laughs> Not all there at the same time, but, um, but all my sickle cell patients are my kids. It's 
just understanding this disease and understanding that a lot of people, especially within the medical profession, who do not have a great understanding of sickle cell disease and it can be much maligned, a, a lot of prejudice, a lot of misunderstanding about what sickle cell disease is, and knowing that, you know, I'm the first person in the medical field that they're meeting when these kids are two months old and mm -hmm. these families are struggling with this diagnosis that they get over the phone and not just a diagnosis that's, oh, you, this is something that you take a medicine for. This is a, a, a life sentence of sickle cell disease. This is what you have for the rest of your life. And so you really have to bond with patients to get the trust. There can be a lot of mistrust in the medical field for various reasons. And you see that a lot more even within the sickle cell community because of the way that many sickle cell patients get treated, um, especially when they seek emergency care, especially for pain. And, and so being able to have somebody that they trust, that's just as crucial to me mm. as writing a prescription for penicillin as it is to making sure that that patient trusts me, that that parent trusts me, and really making sure we have a team that has that. Thankfully, now with our program at Roswell and Children's, we have a really great team with our nurse practitioner, Taylor. We have a psychologist, Taryn Saracena, who's fantastic, and a new attending physician, Katie Carlberg, who's joined us. It's, it's nice to have a great team because we need a good team to be able to take care of these patients, and that's what they deserve. So we've got the medical community, and then we've got the sickle cell community <laughs> as, as sickle cell warriors. Tell us a little bit more about that. So the Sickle Cell Warriors, we are a small nonprofit, small group of people, and we focus on that education and awareness piece the most. Because if people are aware of the disease, of their status, their sickle cell trait status, and things like that, sickle cell can be, I wouldn't say prevented, but they will be aware of what it is they're getting themselves into. So we need to make sure that our community is aware of this disease and then educating our warriors on what it is they can do to have better health, to live better every single day. So when we do our support groups and our other like programs, transition programs and things like that, we make sure that we give our warriors that support and that trust in us that they can talk to us about anything because like Dr. Ambrusco said, we have stigmas in sickle cell. And so when patients are going to these ER visits and or getting admitted in the hospitals, there's things that they go through that they want to discuss. They need people that can relate or that can help them through those type of situations. And I feel like we just provide as much support as possible. And then not only just providing a support and education, but we also work towards just building up as a community in general and just being stronger as a whole. How often does this group meet? We meet once a month. But we give our warriors opportunities to just reach out whenever they want. So we have a community health care worker on our team who reaches out to families at least once or twice a month to make sure they don't need for anything. We provide any resources they might need. And how do you raise awareness to the general public? To the general public, we do a lot of events. We've been hosting a sickle cell awareness walk. We're on our sixth year this year at Delaware Park. And then we also celebrate for Sickle Cell Awareness Day, which happens every June 19th. We make sure that we invite the whole community out to each of those events. But we also make sure that we reach the community by going out in the community, supporting those community events, you know, getting our face out there, getting the information out there as we are talking to the general public. Yeah. Collaboration. Lots collaboration of collaboration. Collaboration is key. Yeah. So recently in the news, the FDA approved two new gene therapies that are being called a, a cure for sickle cell disease. How would these uh, treatments affect patients at Roswell Park? Um, so obviously, it, as you mentioned, it, it was literally just FDA approved in, in December, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. And not just one modality, but two different modalities. It's conducted in a similar way, but there are two different techniques of doing it. As I mentioned before, bone marrow transplant has been available for sickle cell disease, but with the limitation of finding a donor, as well as some of the, the complications that happen because the donor is different than you. The donor rea cells react against you or yourself rejecting the donor. Gene therapy uses your own self, your own stem cells as your source. 
So you, you don't have to look far. That's you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a, a patient would be um, have collection of their own stem cells, have those stem cells be genetically altered in one of these two ways. It still is a bone marrow transplant, but you're getting the preparative regimen with chemotherapy medicines and then getting your own stem cells, just genetically altered ones, put back into you. So a lot of the complications that we've seen with bone marrow transplant for sickle cell disease are become a non-issue with this method, which is fantastic um, and life-changing. So as you can imagine by my explanation, this isn't something you can be like, oh, great, that sounds fantastic, let's start doing it tomorrow. There's a lot of things to get in place because this is a pretty complex technological effort working with the two companies that provide these two different modalities for gene therapy. So we at Roswell Park and Oshai, our program there, we are actively working now with both companies to be able to have Buffalo be the first center in upstate New York to be able to provide these two, wow. both modalities, which is going to be fantastic to be able to offer for our patients and families. And was that the reason you met with Senator Tim Kennedy? Yes. And Juanita was there as well, too, as well as one of my colleagues, Dr. Conwell Malhi, who's a director of our pediatric bone marrow transplant program, because this is done in the context of stem cell therapy. And we were talking before this that there is even new news. Yes, yes. So as you and I were discussing news. before, yes. so one of the, the <laughs> kickers to this great sounding gene therapy is the price tag. As you can imagine, with this kind of technology, it's incredibly pricey. Mm -hmm. I do think that when you hear the price tag for this costing you know upwards of $2 million to do this for one patient, mm -hmm. I think the flip side always need to be considered. That sounds like a price tag, but then you hear what Juanita said before, and that comes with a price tag on somebody's life. Not to mention the fact that just a lifetime of care for sickle cell disease itself can be actually quite expensive, not even including the productivity that can be lost when somebody's in the hospital all the time and not able to work or not able to work as much as they would want otherwise. I think all of that needs to be thought of. So what I just literally came out in the news just a few days ago is that the Biden-Harris administration has put forth an initiative through the Department of Health and Human Services that for gene therapy therapy that sickle cell disease is going to be basically the, the harbinger to be able to put forth effort in getting coverage for gene therapies down the line. This is not isolated to, to sickle cell disease, but sickle cell disease really is the first big one to have impact for gene therapy like this and to say this is the future and we need to look into covering it and what better way to do so than with sickle cell disease. Here in New York State, the, the first step that we're going to need to do what Senator Kennedy and I had spoken about with Juanita there was that in order to get anything really covered, it needs to be reviewed by Medicaid. And that's obviously state-based. So we need New York State Medicaid to look at this, to understand the cost, but to understand the cost of not doing it and really take that into account with, with covering these therapies that are literally life-saving for people. And that will do it for Producers Picks. We thank our guests, Lori Matson, Jessica Shawnee, Juanita McLean, and Dr. Stephen Ambrusco. If you missed anything or want to hear it again, you can get this program as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts or on the Amplify BTPM app. Each episode is online at WBFO.org. I'm Thomas O'Neill-White. Thanks for listening. <laughs>